Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Hey, thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. As you know, new tough DUI laws, some of the toughest in the country, went into effect here in Arizona late last year. Scenes like this now bring with them incredible penalties, very, very tough laws. Keep in mind, first um, offense for being impaired if you have a blood alcohol level of .08 or above. Ten days in jail. You might get some break on that. Fines of $250 plus an additional $500 assessment for DPS and another $500 for the Arizona Prison Construction Fund. Your license, it will be suspended for 90 days. Uh, probation and an ignition interlocking device on your car. The question we raise today is tough enough, not tough enough, too tough. The DUI laws in Arizona, and we're joined by Scott Mason, a DUI attorney with the Mason Law Firm, and with Erica Espino, the executive director of Arizona's chapter of MAD. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, John. Happy Easter to you yes, and your family. Yes, thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Scott, your take on it. You're, you're at the other side of it. You're in court defending people, some of whom are right on the bubble. What's your sense of where we are right now in Arizona on this law? It, it, uh, there's no doubt, John, that we're the toughest state in the country when it comes to laws where consequences of someone's convicted of a DUI. The, the problem um, that I have with it, and when you look at it, is that many cases are different. And with the, the sweeping legislation that was just passed in September is kind of a one-size-fits-all approach, which in my experience, and again in my view, that's not the best way in terms of a policy decision to handle this type of issue. Can you give me an example? Tell me, a, a, and, a, and you don't have to obviously name names because of attorney-client privilege, privilege, but give me an example of somebody you've represented who you looked at and you said, man, this is awfully harsh given these circumstances. Can you, can you recall a case? Sure. I mean, there are a number of cases. Um, you know, the cases that are always, for me, very difficult where someone has two drinks, uh, one or two drinks with dinner, uh, and is maybe on, on a medication or, or maybe there's... Um, some issue where there's not a lot of alcohol in their system, but they may show that they're impaired for whatever reasons. And sometimes they could be fatigued, uh, and the, the effects aren't just from alcohol. But when they're stopped by a police officer and there's some alcohol uh, in their body, and whether it's above the limit or below the limit, you no, know, they look guilty. You know, the view in Arizona from where I uh, sit, and I, I've been a prosecutor, I've been on the other side prosecuting these on cases. On DUI. Correct. I've worked for a judge, and I've also defended people, is that it seems to be um, a little, the pendulum has swung a little bit uh, where in terms of difficult, in terms of unrealistic consequences on something like this. All right. Uh, as promised, I mean, in the spirit of information, Scott Mason is a noted DUI attorney. I'm going to ask you straight up. For people who are stopped, if they've been drinking, what should they and should not do? The, the first thing, John, is don't put yourself in the situation, obviously. But if they are stopped, there are a few things that, that they need to know. They do have rights, and one of the first things they do is they have a right. If they've been drinking, they know they shouldn't be driving. They have a right not to answer any of the officer's questions. You know, you have a right to keep your mouth shut, really. Is that the best course of action? It, it is. Um, yeah, everyone thinks that they can talk their way out of it or, or cooperate or be friendly with the police. Anything they say can and will be used against them in the court. Should they say, um, I'm not going to speak, you have to talk to my attorney? They, that's the second thing they should do, is they should invoke their right to, to an attorney. And uh, they, they, that puts the burden on the police then to do a number of things that, that most police officers aren't trained with the ins and outs and the intricacies of this area of law and aren't going to handle it correctly. The, the field sobriety test, the coordination test, you know, the, the finger to my nose and the walk a straight line. Can you deny it? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you have a right to refuse those tests, and again, it's my view as a defense attorney, and again, no disrespect to Erica and her, and her organization, but, but those tests aren't going to be there to help you. There isn't someone like myself that also has training in this or it's objectively uh, looking at whether you're going to pass or fail. Um, the officers there, if they think you've been drinking, it's not like it was a number of years ago where they're really going to truly investigate and find out, is this someone that's impaired or not? If you're stopped in Arizona now and they suspect you have alcohol, you're going to get a ticket and you're going to go to court and you're going to have to deal with uh, a DUI. So the presumption of guilt is, is on you. I mean, it's not innocent until proven guilty. There's a presumption right off, off the bat. It certainly legally isn't, but it's certainly my view that all practicality, that's what's going on. Before we go to break, um, does it tick you off when Scott says this stuff? 
No, but I think it's important to know, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but if somebody does refuse a field sobriety test, they also have the option of losing their license for one year. If they refuse a blood, breath, or, or urine test only. So a coordination test, someone completely has a right to refuse, but in terms of a, a chemical test, Erica is correct that they do have to do that if the police have cause, and that's an issue that... You Can know, you refuse breathalyzer and say, I'll do blood, and do you have a better chance with blood than breathalyzer? Breathalyzer is, is the, the preferred test if someone's going, going to do a test, but the, oh, really? the motorist, yes, yes, but the motorist doesn't have a choice. That's at the, the discretion of the officer. Very interesting information. You forgive me? Absolutely. <laughs> but I have to say, I do applaud Scott for saying, you know, they shouldn't have put themselves no, in that predicament well, in the first place. Well, that's the answer. That's the answer right from the get-go. It, it is, it's a tough call. Final thought. We've got about 30 seconds left. I'll give you 15 and you 15. Scott, go ahead. You know, I think uh, really on the whole topic, I think people need to be informed. You know, they need to be informed about uh, what their rights are when it comes to this situation. Um, they need to be informed about what their options are so they don't they put themselves in this situation where they have to talk with an attorney, have to go to court, and they don't have to deal with it. I mean, really, uh, they need to be informed. They need to have a plan, and that's what I'd recommend. You got six, eight seconds. You took some of your time. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and just to correct something really quick, I just want to mention that, you know, we do not drive impaired at all in any way. Okay. That's a good point. We'll see you next week.